rejection of the treaty. Iraq jails a British cyclist for 10 years for illegally entering the country. The Foreign Office protests. UN peacekeepers in Sarajevo are seriously wounded in a mortar attack. The Cannon Street rail crash inquiry tells BR it must scrap its old trains. And a new test which could help prevent some babies being born too early. The government has made it clear that it won't try to ratify the Maastricht Treaty if the French reject it in their referendum later this month. Downing Street says John Major has acknowledged that the treaty will be finished if there's a no vote. Labour says if the treaty was rejected by the French, it would cause major economic problems for Britain and throw political and monetary union back into the melting pot. The Liberal Democrat leader, Paddy Ashdown, has attacked the Prime Minister for not playing a more active part in trying to convince the French to back the treaty. Politicians throughout Europe who supported the Maastricht Treaty are now having to face the prospect that the French may veto the whole deal. A Danish group started a London visit talking to Labour. Tomorrow they'll meet the Prime Minister. They're making it clear that whatever happens in France, the Danish no in their referendum makes it very difficult for the treaty to survive. According to our constitution, we have said no to the Maastricht Treaty at the 2nd of June, and what we are looking after now is a new framework, a specific arrangement for Denmark, which does respect the referendum on the 2nd of June 100%. The Labour leadership have reservations about the Maastricht Treaty, but they've no doubt about the dangers of a French rejection. It would mean a major crisis for the European community. It would mean perhaps uh, serious economic difficulties in Britain and maybe in other European community countries too. It would be real problems for Britain and for our European partners. The Prime Minister's office said today that on balance Mr Major believed the Maastricht Treaty was good for Europe and for Britain. But it was Downing Street's acknowledgement that if the French said no, the treaty would die, that drew criticism from a former Conservative Cabinet Minister who's been among the leading opponents of the treaty. Any amendment must be by unanimous agreement of all the nations. And the Danes have said no, so the treaty is dead. To suggest that it will now die if the French say no, they say it seems a most remarkable misreading of the treaty and suggests that uh, the Danes don't count. But for the Chancellor, Norman Lamont, and his fellow European finance ministers, the vote in France is still seen as the vital test of whether the treaty can be put into effect. And when they assemble for their next meeting in Bath this weekend, under Mr Lamont's chairmanship, they'll be looking at contingency plans for a no vote. They'll want to convince the foreign exchange markets that whatever happens, the European exchange rate mechanism will still survive. Some opposition politicians are calling on the government to act more positively now. The John Major should stay silent. Yet again, stand at the side, wring his hands, but do nothing is, I think, not the act of a Prime Minister. It's time the Prime Minister started to think less about the unity of the Conservative Party and more about the interests of Britain and the future of Europe. Some leading mainstream Conservatives who went along with the Maastricht Treaty are now privately hoping that the French will say no. They believe this would avoid a serious Tory split and enable the Prime Minister to devalue the pound. But that's certainly not the view being expressed on Mr Major's behalf. He's said to be as determined as ever to defend the present rate of the pound, even if that means putting Britain's high interest rates even higher. The two latest opinion polls in France suggest a narrow majority in favour of the Maastricht Treaty. Other recent polls pointed to tiny majorities both for and against, and even a dead heat. In France, supporters of a no vote are taking advantage of worries about the effects of the exchange rate mechanism. Unemployment has reached 3 million, and though the economy is growing, French companies say more job losses are on the way. This report from our Europe business correspondent, Jonathan Charles. On the campaign trail, extreme right-wing leader Jean-Marie Le Pen battling for the hearts and minds of France. Mr Le Pen tells his audiences that European Union won't bring them wealth or jobs. They must vote Maastricht down. No. The National Front leader insists France's experiences of European economic cooperation so far are no recommendation. 
13 years in the exchange rate mechanism a mixed blessing. This concrete producer, like much of French industry, believes ERM membership is good, giving France low inflation and strong growth. But Lefarge Coffre is concerned, though, that interest rates at 10.5% are now too high. It wishes the French government, a founder of the mechanism, could act unilaterally. I'm in a, in a fairly capital-intensive sector. I mean, our company uh, invests a lot of money, and I do recognize that the interest rates at the level they are now are much too high for industrial investment to develop. At Belleville Job Centre on the outskirts of Paris, the constraints of the ERM are partially blamed by the unemployed for their plight. These are some of France's three million jobless, unhappy their government isn't free to boost the economy to create work. Many of the unemployed don't believe business leaders who preach the creed of European cooperation. With a yes, it will be possible to have in the future lower rates of interest that mean increase in employment, increase in business. At this Paris food market, such optimism isn't echoed. Interest rates of 6% would be needed to reduce unemployment, according to economists, not currently possible in the ERM. France's economic ills haven't been cured by the exchange rate mechanism. 13 years of ERM membership have simply reduced the ability of the French government to act independently. Eurosceptics, both here and in Britain, argue it's evidence that closer European cooperation brings as many problems as it does solutions. Here, President Mitterrand's unpopular government now has to hammer home a different message, stressing France can't live in economic isolation. Jonathan Charles, BBC News, Paris. Britain's currency reserves fell by $1.3 billion last month because of Bank of England intervention on the foreign exchanges. The drop, equivalent to nearly £650 million, was the biggest since Britain joined the European exchange rate mechanism two years ago. The Treasury said the fall showed its resolve to defend the pound's value. The shadow chancellor, Gordon Brown, said it represented the price the country was paying for the government's mistakes. The pound has gone up slightly on the foreign exchanges. It rose half a pfennig against the German mark and more than half a cent against the American dollar. The Bank of England admitted publicly last week it was dipping into the currency reserves to buy pounds on the foreign exchanges. Today it became clear it spent well over a billion dollars in the process. Using the reserves in this way pushes up demand for the pound. It's just one of a number of options the government has to keep the pound's value within its permitted levels in the exchange rate mechanism. If the pound's heading towards its ERM floor, the first thing the government can do is talk up the currency by issuing strong policy statements. After that, it can intervene on the foreign exchanges, as it has been, by buying pounds and paying in foreign currency from the reserves. If that doesn't do the trick, it can raise interest rates to make sterling a more attractive investment. If all else fails, it could seek a devaluation, which would give the pound more leeway. The government has firmly ruled out the devaluation option, but currency dealers think it will have to do a lot more intervening. I think in the next three weeks, the amount it will have to spend is likely to be greater than the amount it spent in the whole of August, uh, and that over the next three weeks, the Bank of England, at the government's uh, request, will spend as much money as is needed to prevent sterling falling out of its bands in the exchange rate mechanism. With the gold and foreign currency reserves standing at over $44 billion, the Bank of England has plenty of ammunition with which to defend the currency. It will be hoping that attention has once again switched to a weak dollar on the foreign exchanges. But the pound is still perilously close to its ERM floor, and further intervention is likely to be needed. Michael Wainwright, one of two Britons being held in Baghdad, has been sentenced to 10 years by an Iraqi court for illegally entering the country. The British government has summoned an Iraqi diplomat in London to protest. Earlier, the Foreign Office said the Red Cross had visited Mr Wainwright and the other Briton held, Paul Ride. They were both said to be in good health and good spirits. The Foreign Office has said the 10-year sentence imposed on Michael Wainwright is totally disproportionate. It is calling in the head of the Iraqi interest section at the Jordanian embassy to protest. It learned of the sentence through the Red Cross. Mr Wainwright, a casual labourer, was picked up in early May after he cycled from Turkey into northern Iraq. The news of his sentence came shortly after his family had welcomed word from the Red Cross, which visited both Mr. Wainwright and Paul Ride in prison in Iraq and found them both in good health and good spirits. 
uh, we've all all sent letters um, hoping that he'll receive them and we've actually put uh, some spare sheets of paper in and an envelope for him to write back. Paul Ride, a catering worker seen here in a family video, was jailed for seven years two weeks ago also for illegal entry without a visa. His wife said she believed he'd been kidnapped for use as a hostage because of the air exclusion zone over southern Iraq. American surveillance planes have been joined by British tornadoes monitoring Saddam Hussein's treatment of the Shia Muslims. A senior Iraqi official has said Iraqi forces have been ordered not to shoot at the Allied planes, but tension between Iraq and the West remains high. Maurice Zifferero, the Italian leader of the latest nuclear inspection team to visit Iraq, said at the end of his second day in the field that Iraq's nuclear program had been rendered harmless. It now stands at zero, he said. Lord Irwin, the co-chairman of the Yugoslav Peace Conference, has warned that the EC will not accept the policy of clearing people from their homes known as ethnic cleansing. He said sanctions will be imposed for years, if necessary, to force the warring parties to abide by the commitments they made in London last week. In Bosnia, Serbian forces have agreed to place most of their heavy weapons in and around Sarajevo under UN supervision, but the fighting has continued. Last night, five UN soldiers were injured, and this afternoon, the shelling of Sarajevo began again. The UN's task is confounded by it being attacked and being unable to deal with the realities of life here. A huge fire in the barracks of the Egyptians last night. What should have been a simple fire control operation became another Sarajevo mess. The Egyptians had stored petrol and diesel together in an old shed. The local brigade, with little equipment, was overwhelmed. The French sent a tender from the airport. Then in came shells. The tender driver was injured and a French lieutenant colonel. And the Egyptian colonel was badly wounded in both legs. The fire was left to rage through Captain Mohammed's workshops and several other buildings. The UN also has problems with its aid. For days now, it's failed to send off a convoy to the town of Garajda. There's been heavy fighting in the area, and the Muslims appear to have the upper hand. The Serbs won't let the convoy through. Why? They are convinced that the UN has convoyed weapons to the Muslims. Munitions, 12.7 millimeters from Turkey, who improper gives the another side, Muslim side. He and his colleagues who believe this are on the hills above Sarajevo. They're part of the circle of fire around the city. They have light weapons and would not be subject to any agreement reached between their leader, Mr. Karadzic, and the UN regarding monitoring. Elsewhere in the woods are the field guns and heavy mortars and tanks which pound the city. Eleven of these positions are now under UN inspection. That won't stop the shells, though. They'll just be watched and counted. And today, the guns fired on. A bad thing, said the Serbs, but we don't want to become Muslims. Any agreement to silence these guns has to be taken in context. The UN has been attacked. It's also been deceived before. Kate Aidy, BBC News, Sarajevo. Rail crash investigators say old, deficient rolling stock contributed to the casualties in a train crash at London's Cannon Street station in January last year. The report by the Health and Safety Executive blames the train driver for causing the accident by failing to brake properly. Two people died and more than 500 were injured in the crash. The Cannon Street crash took place at the height of the London rush hour when the train collided heavily with the station buffers. The inspectors have concluded that the driver was to blame after intensive testing of the braking mechanism. From that testing I found no evidence that would indicate there was a brake failure of any description and therefore the only reasonable conclusion is that the accident was caused by an error of judgment on the part of the driver. In medical tests three days after the tragedy, the driver, Morris Graham, tested positive for cannabis, but there was no proof he was affected by drugs at the time of the crash. Among today's recommendations are that there should be immediate alcohol and drugs tests for railway employees following an accident. It also wants black box data recorders on trains and the older trains, like the one involved in the Cannon Street crash, withdrawn as soon as possible. The inspectors say that the 1950s trains just aren't as crashworthy as modern ones, explaining the high number of injuries at Cannon Street. British Rail says it will take years to replace its fleet. The bulk of those trains will be replaced over the next three to four years. 
the very small remaining number uh, we hope to replace within two years of that. That'll leave the older style train still in service until at least 1997. And while the government insists it wants to press ahead with safety investment, critics claim the investment is not coming fast enough and that the government is too obsessed with privatisation. Order the new trains immediately that makes it safe. Now begin to see you implement the recommendations from this report, which you should have recommended and implemented from four or five years ago. Get on with the job. Make the railways safe. Don't be obsessed with privatisation. Further investment by British Rail is undoubtedly necessary in rolling stock and will occur. But our plans for privatisation will not cause a hiatus in British Rail's investment programme for rolling stock. The first of the new trains is due to enter service within the next few weeks and though it'll be some years before the whole fleet is renewed, British Rail are hoping that today's report will keep up the impetus for new investment and even persuade the government to come up with the extra money BR says it needs. Later in this news, President Bush steps up the attack on his opponent as the polls show him up to 20 points behind. He warns again Bill Clinton's policies will mean higher taxes for most Americans. And the disappearing gardens of Cornwall, new householders fear for their homes. Now the time is 6.17. main stories this evening, Downing Street has made it clear that if the French vote against the Maastricht Treaty, the British government will immediately withdraw the bill designed to ratify the treaty. Michael Wainwright from Britain, who was arrested while cycling through Iraq, has been sentenced to 10 years in jail. The Foreign Office has protested. Three members of the UN Protection Force in Sarajevo have been seriously wounded in a mortar attack. Serbian leaders there have agreed to put their heaviest weapons under UN supervision. The Foreign Secretary Douglas Hurd is visiting South Africa as part of a European community effort to restart negotiations between the government and black opposition leaders. The talks, which are aimed at establishing a non-racial constitution, collapsed in June when the ANC pulled out in protest at the continuing political violence in the townships. Arriving in Johannesburg, and no stranger to South Africa's politics and its violence, the Foreign Secretary said Europe, with all its distractions, was nevertheless keen to encourage peace, political reform and economic stability in this part of the continent. Mr Hurd stressed, however, that the government and the ANC here, and not the international community, would have to make an agreement work. But he denied he was here to bang heads together. It's not for Europeans to come and bang people's heads together in South Africa or Africa. That is, uh, uh, that is not, uh, in the second half of the 20th century, a, a reality. No, we are not here to do that. We are here as friends. Meanwhile, at a National Party conference in the Orange Free State, F.W. de Klerk condemned what he called the ANC's brand of intimidation politics. But having said that, the president added this prediction. I have reason to believe that within a reasonable time, Multi-party negotiation will be on track again. After lunch with the president in Pretoria, Mr. Hurd, with his Danish and Portuguese counterparts, held talks in Johannesburg with the ANC leader, Nelson Mandela. They are here in order to find out what is going on, to help if they are required, but uh, the final decision of resolving problems is that of South Africa. Mr. Mandela appeared subdued, distracted by the fact that the ANC's national executive was today embroiled in argument about whether to return to the negotiating table. Having spoken to both sides who won't negotiate with one another, was Mr. Hurd now despairing? I certainly do not despair. <laughs> There's no doubt that intervention by the international community does influence events in South Africa, even though alone it can't resolve its problems. I understand that one direct result of Mr. Hurd's visit is that a team of between 10 and 20 Europeans will now join Judge Goldstone's special task force investigating crimes committed by the security forces, a move designed to enhance police accountability and, in turn, political reform. John Harrison, BBC News, Johannesburg. An earthquake measuring seven points on the Richter scale has been felt off the coast of Nicaragua. The quake's epicentre was in the Pacific coast to the south of the capital, Managua. At least 30 people were killed and hundreds more were injured when a tidal wave, 40 feet high, swept through coastal towns and swamped islands. Houses and vehicles in its path were destroyed. Thousands have fled their homes and are now sheltering on higher ground inland. 
Doctors at Hammersmith Hospital in London have developed a new medical test which could help predict premature births. It's hoped the test, which is still undergoing clinical trials, could save the lives of babies born early. Two and a half thousand children die every year in Britain as a result of premature deliveries. This baby girl born at 28 weeks is one of around 50,000 premature babies born every year in the UK. Attached to a ventilator, she's expected to stay in intensive care for up to two months at a cost to the NHS of £1,000 a day. At the moment, doctors have no means of predicting which women are likely to give birth prematurely so that they can give drugs to try and stop the onset of labour. If the new test proves effective, it could help avoid some of the long-term problems which can affect babies born prematurely, such as lung and heart disorders or mental handicap. The benefit of the test, I think, at the moment lies in its potential. Um, the trials published so far um, have indicated that if the test is negative, the woman has got a very, very small chance indeed of going into premature labour. What is less clear is what is the outcome of the pregnancy if the test is positive. And I think that needs uh, further trial. The test, which is undergoing clinical trials in Manchester and Leicester, involves taking a cervical swab, which is tested for a protein called fetal fibronectin. If the protein is present, it suggests that the membranes protecting the baby have been broken or damaged, and that the woman is likely to go into premature labour within a fortnight. 93% of the women who have tested positive have delivered preterm. Now, with this aid, doctors can intervene to help ladies to prevent preterm birth. If the clinical trials are successful, the test could be used as a routine part of antenatal screening, particularly for high-risk women like those expecting multiple births or who've previously had preterm babies. Doctors say that could not only save lives, but also the high cost of intensive care for premature babies. A British engineer who'd been given a hundred-year jail sentence for the murder of his wife in Thailand arrived back in Britain today a free man. Carl Maxwell Smith was granted an amnesty by the Queen of Thailand. Mr Maxwell Smith said he now wanted to concentrate on clearing his name and obtaining a full pardon. The BBC's Director General Sir Michael Checkland has confirmed that talks are underway with the satellite station B Sky B about setting up a joint 24-hour television news channel. Sir Michael denied rumours that when he retires next February, his successor John Burt will make wholesale programming changes. While BBC Radio was celebrating its 70th birthday with a special exhibition at Broadcasting House in London, the BBC's Director General today dismissed reports that Radio 2 and Radio 5 are to be axed. But BBC Radio services, like BBC Television, will have to adapt, he said. Radio 1 and Radio 2 will have more speech and news, and there are some sorts of programmes, like television game shows, which the BBC won't be making in future. And he confirmed that the BBC is in talks with Sky Television, half-owned by newspaper publisher Rupert Murdoch, about jointly running a 24-hour television news channel in place of the present Sky News. In terms of television, we believe there should be a 24-hour news under the editorial control of the BBC. Now, the only way for that to be done is on satellite. So we have to find partners who will be involved with the marketing and the finance, leaving the editorial direction to ourselves. And that is something which we are in discussion with Sky. But critics say a tie-up with Sky would be a boost for the BBC's rival and stifle a third force in television news. It's going to assist Sky uh, to grow, to sell more dishes, to get more subscribers. And this, this can only threaten the audience share which the BBC gets. I think the other aspect of this, of course, is that it's very likely to wipe out uh, news on B Sky B, which they do themselves, and that's going to mean that there's, there's going to be less news about. The attack on the BBC last week by Michael Grade, chief executive of Channel 4, has produced a bruising few days for the corporation. Sir Michael Checkland, seen here at a BBC conference in May, reportedly hasn't seen eye to eye with his successor, John Burt. But today he denied a rift and said the corporation planned a positive statement on its future this autumn. In the United States, the latest opinion polls show President Bush up to 20 points behind his Democrat opponent in the presidential race, Bill Clinton. Now the president has gone on the attack over Governor Clinton's economic policy, warning it would mean higher taxes and would put the American economy in danger. 
trailing badly in the opinion polls and hitting the campaign trail with a vengeance, George Bush is now clinging to the one issue he hopes can still turn things around. Take the subject of taxation. My opponent says the government taxes too much of your, uh, takes too much of your money in taxes, but they want to take more of it. $150 billion already proposed. Last month's Republican convention didn't bring the boost Mr. Bush expected, and he's taken a deliberate decision to use the Democrats' tax proposals to alarm the electorate. Who do you trust in this election? The candidate who's racked, raised taxes one time and regrets it, or the other candidate who raised taxes and fees 128 times and enjoyed it every time? People are ready because they've had enough. In an increasingly acrimonious exchange, the Democrats have launched TV advertisements denouncing the Republican allegations as shameless scare tactics. Administration officials are admitting that they know they're not telling the truth, but they, they say they can, intend to continue uh, falsifying the record because they think it works. Earlier this year, George Bush revealed he was hoping to copy John Major's tactics for winning re-election against the odds. He set an example that I think bodes well for me. And with his highlighting of the Democrats' tax plans, exaggerating their impact according to his political opponents, George Bush does seem to be taking a leaf out of John Major's book, now hoping the issue will help his re-election prospects in the same way it helped Mr. Major. Martin Sixsmith, BBC News, Washington. The former Soviet chess champion Boris Spassky has begun playing the controversial match against his old rival Bobby Fischer in Montenegro in what was Yugoslavia. The game's going on in defiance of UN sanctions. Earlier this week, the American government threatened Fischer, an American citizen, with a fine or jail if he played. Now Spassky, who's defected to France, is also being threatened with punishment by the French government. An investigation has begun in a Cornish town where it's feared that many homes are in danger of collapse. Two large craters recently appeared in the gardens of houses in Gunnys Lake. It's now been discovered that they were built over a disused mine shaft. Further west, a deep shaft has opened up in the village of Ashton. Experts say the problem is being made worse by dry weather followed by heavy rain. The most recent mine shaft suddenly opened up this week in the garden of 68-year-old John Cooper. The area was mined more than 100 years ago, but he was stunned when the hole appeared just yards from his house. Very horrified, shocked. Although it had been happening around the county, and probably it was not such a big surprise. Ten weeks ago, a family with three young children narrowly escaped death when their entire back garden plunged into a 700-foot deep shaft in Gunnys Lake. It was supposed to have been capped, but experts believe it was loosened by dry weather. Recent heavy rains thought to have caused another collapse at a nearby house. It's the legacy of Cornwall's ancient tin and copper mining industry. The county's like a Swiss cheese. Half the surface area is riddled with mines. All we know is that there are vast areas of Cornwall where a lot of mining took place and where we know of thousands of shafts. We certainly can't be sure that we're clear of mining um, or mine exploration anywhere in Cornwall. People who've suffered collapses have been told they'll have to claim on insurance, but in one case the companies refused to pay the full value of the condemned house. One MP says government help should not be expected. I hope some money might be able to be made available through the councils that have got particular problems, but I don't think it'd be right or realistic to give the impression that somehow the government is going to solve every problem that does appear and is unfortunately going to appear uh, over the coming years. The council started test drilling today to determine precisely which areas of Gunners Lake are at the greatest risk. But property's already been blighted, insurance has been refused, and people are living in fear. Well, that's all the news so far this evening. There'll be more at nine. From Andrew and from me, good evening. Hello, I think we could describe the setup over the next couple of days as being a cool, showery one with some sunshine. There's just one exception to that which may or may not come off, and I'm going to take a look at that first. And that's later tomorrow afternoon and evening. We could find some thicker cloud and rain coming into the southwest, and as it moves across southern counties of England, it may just phase in with the showers further north. Now, it may or may not happen, but if it is going to happen, the clues are on the weather chart. Here's what we have at the moment, this area of low pressure moving into the North Sea, and these two weather fronts brought rain, the second one tending to be much more showery. 
But let's have a look at this system here. We're likely to see that break away, and that's a system that'll bring that rain into the southwest if it's going to happen. Otherwise, we've got a run of fairly strong west and northwesterly winds bringing quite a few showers. So let's take a look at those winds, still quite strong in the south, coming from a southwesterly direction, but gradually they go round west or northwesterly, and we'll all be in that boat tomorrow, west, northwesterly winds, and quite brisk, bringing in a fair number of showers. And looking at showers, the rainfall radar shows quite a lot still over northern Scotland, and as we come further south too, some bright echoes over northern England, maybe one or two a little uh, sharp showers, maybe even the odd rumble of thunder around, and these showers will continue to feed southeastwards during this evening and tonight. They'll move down into East Anglia, the southeast, clear skies behind it. We'll still have some of these showers scattered around western and northern coast, and turning quite chilly for the north too. The temperatures tonight could be down as low as 5 or 7. Then on to tomorrow, a fairly bright and sunny start in places. Perhaps I've overdone the sunshine a little bit, but uh, never mind. It'll be mostly dry, and then we find these showers around these western and northern coasts becoming much more widespread and frequent through the day, some of them quite heavy up to the north and west here, with some hail and thunder mixed in with it as well. We shouldn't see too many, I think, through East Anglia, the southeast, and some southern counties. Then the clouds thickening down in the southwest, perhaps bringing some rain into Cornwall and Devon, Devon through the afternoon and evening, and the showers tending to die out further south, but this cloud spilling across southern counties. Cold, as you could expect in the northwest, temperatures only 10 to 12, but there could be as high as 18 or 19 down in the southeast, and the winds pretty brisk from the west or northwest. That's it from me. Good evening to you.